Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for joining us today for our Leaders of Influence webinar, Performing Under Pressure, Advanced Materials for Extreme Environments, presented by Dr. Michael Heitzman, Professor Paul Meehan, and Dr. Juan Hidalgo from the UQ Centre for Advanced Materials Processing and Manufacturing. My name's Kyle Williams, and I'm the Deputy Director of Engagement and Philanthropy in the Faculty of Engineering, Architecture, and Information Technology. And I'll be helping facilitate the session today. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Michael Heitzman, who will be facilitating the session. Dr. Heitzman is the co-director of the Centre for Advanced Materials Processing and Manufacturing, also known as AMPAM, uh, with an expertise in advanced composite materials and processes and new product development. Okay, thank you very much and welcome everyone to this webinar. It's a really great pleasure to be hosting uh, this webinar and on behalf of all the researchers in MPAM, I would like to welcome everyone. Before we get into it, I would like to uh, do the acknowledgement of country. So we acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodianship of the lands on which we meet. Um, I, I think we have a very rich history and, and I think we can take some inspiration from the uh, traditional owners particularly when it comes to the sustainable use of resources and the land. And, and I think that's a really important inspiration, both for uh, our society, but also uh, for us as material and manufacturing researchers. So today's seminar will be focusing on one of our research themes, which is the theme of uh, materials for uh, advanced uh, and extreme environments. But before we get into it, I would just like to provide a little bit of an overview of our center, Center for Advanced Material Processing and Manufacturing. The center is really unique in the sense that it has the aim to bring together a large number of researchers spanning three different schools and one of the institutes. So within the center, we have researchers from the School of Chemical Engineering, School of Mechanical and Mining Engineering, as well as researchers from Civil Engineering and the uh, IIBN Institute. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the figures from uh, 2019. So overall, the research income of the center, just to give you an idea of the size of the center, was around uh, 11 million in research income. Uh, we published over 260 international journal papers in, in one year. And I think one thing which is really important tonight is that our center is extremely industry focused with over 64% of the industry of the income being uh, focused on uh, or derived from industry uh, sources. And, and also, I think it's reflected to the large number of current industry participants we have, which uh, totals over uh, 78 uh, currently active industry partners. The center uh, spans 68 researchers, really covering the entire landscape from material manufacturing and digital fabrication and design. And as you can see, we are also uh, educate and train a, a large number of HDR students. So the current number is sitting uh, above 110 HDR students with around 20 graduating every year. We're particularly proud of, of our impact, both in respect to uh, academic impact writings, but also really making a change uh, in, or an impact in, in industry. So, for example, last year, uh, Professor Chin Tsui was ranked as number uh, uh, within the top 1% of the most cited in his field. On the other side, uh, we managed to cite some of our industry partners large amounts of money. So, for example, Cook Medical through uh, the Medical uh, Devices Hub, and, and then also uh, managed to really bring products into the field with, for example, over 500 new rare guides uh, being field tested uh, in Queensland. 
Now, the research areas in the center, we divided into three streams, just to give you an overview. And today, we're really focusing down on, on one of those streams. But just before we get into that, I will quick introduce the other two streams. So the first stream is materials and manufacturing for a sustainable world. And, and this includes a very exciting portfolio of research related to biocomposites and biopolymers. And, and that really starts at the extraction of biopolymers, the synthesing, the processing, and goes all the way to then developing products that are more sustainable and help us to reduce the carbon footprint. On the other side, we also have a group which is world leading around the development of lead free solder technology, as well as researchers which research and develop new energy storage materials that are being employed in solar cells or in batteries. The second theme within our center is what we call the theme of digital fabrication and design. This includes areas such as incremental sheet forming, which we will see a demonstration today, uh, simulation and automation, additive manufacturing, where UQ has a very strong presence around metal solidification, but there's also exciting projects that are on the way looking at novel uh, polymer materials and ceramics for 3D printing. Then we have the area uh, of structural health monitoring and structural health management, as well as di digital fabrication research related predominantly uh, for the built environment, so civil engineering application and told in timber buildings. The theme that we are focusing on a little bit more today is what we've already mentioned. So the theme, materials and processes for extreme environments. Now, again, this theme is larger than what we can cover today, but it includes areas such as uh, medical research. So really trying to get materials into the human body, which at times can be quite an extreme endeavor. Then light fighting, predominantly uh, aimed at defense and transport applications. Uh, the fire testing, again something, or fire testing and engineering, again something which we'll discuss today. High temperature materials, another aspect which we'll cover today, and then wear and corrosion research. Now, when we're trying to focus in on a topic, um, it's, it's very easy to um, forget about other researchers that are working in this field, and particularly in the area of uh, materials for extreme environments, we really have a lot of critical mass and some very well-known researchers doing excellent research in that area, covering applications ranging from rail transport, mining, oil and gas, hypersonic applications, all the way to building and construction or applications in the ocean. Now today we'll only feature three researchers, um, which will focus on wear, fire, and uh, high temperature composite materials. But as you can see, there are a lot of other areas such as uh, max phase ceramic materials, high entropy alloys, research into hydrogen and brittlement, polymer and polymer matrix composites application for wear, as well as the durability of, for example, wood products that fall under the center. And just to, to give you an idea of how diverse it is, so we even look at the wear performance of cricket balls in a project for Cricket Australia. So if you have interest in these areas, I have listed the key researchers on the bottom, and you can also reach out to me to be put in contact with the right expert in this field. But now we have planned something slightly different. I think over the last few 
uh, months. I think everyone has probably had enough of PowerPoint presentations over Zoom. So we really tried to push a little bit the boundaries of what is possible in these type of presentations. And in this webinar, we are trying to uh, bring content to you live from three different labs. They are located across uh, four different floors. And I think that by itself represents a little bit of a technical challenge. I think we practice quite a bit, but if we do have any technical glitches, I hope you stay with us um, at the end of the seminar. Um, we were very keen to hear your feedback, but the idea is really to give you a sort of a live view into some of our labs and get actually the researchers in the lab to demonstrate some of their research and the characterization techniques. So with, with that, um, I would like to hand over to Paul Meehan and we will also put up a little poll uh, while we are doing this handover. The idea of the poll is just to capture a little bit who we have online because it's always very anonymous because we can't really see uh, who's it on the other side. Uh, in, in uh, the I thought I was just going to talk. Okay, yep. Okay. Okay, so, so now it's my pleasure to hand over to Paul Meehan, uh, expert in tribology, and he will stream live from the tribology lab on level two. Okay, welcome everyone. It's uh, my pleasure to be here to give you a little bit of an overview of some of the major projects uh, we've been doing as part of AMPAM. Um, the first is uh, what's known as incremental uh, sheet forming. Um, it's a pro new process uh, in which we make an infinite variety of complex shapes out of flat sheet metal. Um, in this case, you can see we're trying to attempt to, to make a human face um, and we'll show the outcome in a second. Uh, this process is a bit like 3D printing, except instead of adding material locally, uh, we're locally bending uh, the material. Um, and we're working uh, with Boeing on this project uh, because they're very interested in this process because um, it will make maintaining and replacing spare parts on aircraft much, much cheaper. Uh, the reason being that we have one machine can make an infinite variety of shapes uh, as opposed to uh, the typical press forming process uh, in, in which you need very expensive dyes of all the different shapes they need for an aircraft uh, to be maintained uh, in order to uh, replace spare parts for aircraft. Um, the process is usually done in, the, in several stages. We're just showing the first stage here. Uh, we've got a little bit of a, a video uh, showing here, sped up, just so you can see uh, the process. So the process is much slower than press forming, um, but it allows you to make an infinite variety of shapes like 3D printing from a, a computer designed uh, package. One of the critical areas we're working on is to try and make the shapes more accurately um, uh, so that the, the process gets taken up by industry. Um, and we're focusing on modeling uh, the physics of the process, optimization, and we're doing online automatic feedback control as well. Um, so I'll take you through to how we uh, take those measurements for this process. Uh, so this is our uh, uh, finished product uh, for this. 
Uh, and um, if we're making an aircraft part, for instance, we need to test the geometry, the accuracy of the geometry at all parts of that 3D shape. Uh, so Sheng can show you now how that's done using a, a 3D laser scanner. Yeah, so once we finish the part, we can uh, do a 3D scan of this part by using this handheld 3D scanner. The advantage of this 3D scanner um, is firstly, it, it does this shiny surface because there's always, always a big challenge of scanning a shiny surface um, with a 3D scanner. So this one, it can change the laser output to a very uh, high level. So you, you get enough feedback from the shiny surface. Another good thing is it can, you can see those black dots. Uh, these are registration targets. So by using those uh, targets, the scanner, you can handheld the scanner and you can move your object as well. So uh, just all by helping, uh, by using those targets, the software can uh, register the scan in the real time. So uh, I have done, i just quickly show you how this scan is done, but I've done a completed one. I just take it, and um, and also we use this scanner in a few different scenarios. Firstly, obviously we're trying to check the accuracy of our forming. We also use this scan as a feedback control, which uh, we actually um, divide our forming into a few different steps. And uh, so this is a full scan you can see we subdivide our forming into a few different steps. And once we've done one step, we do a scan and we have developed a control algorithm to um, actually change the forming process of the next step, trying to uh, compensate all those errors. So the purpose of that control is we can get the accurate um, forming in just one go. We don't have to use try and error. Okay. Thanks, Xing. Um, I'll take you over to a number of bearings. Um, so we've recently completed and, and are doing a number of projects uh, related to bearing wear and tribology. Uh, what you see here, uh, see this large bearing here and another one here, which is a spherical roller bearing. Uh, they're the large bearings used in uh, railways, in particular the, the bogies. Um, and there's many of them in a fleet of trains um, and they're very costly to maintain. Uh, so every eight years or so, you need to replace these bearings. Um, and the main reason why we've, we've realised is mainly due to the life of the grease, so the degradation of the grease you see there. Um, and if we look closely into that grease, we've found the main reason for degradation is wear from the rolling contact process. Uh, so we've, again, developed a good understanding of the physics behind what's, what's going on and developed models to predict uh, the wear under different conditions and then tried to optimise that process uh, so that uh, we can maintain uh, based on the, the actual degradation of the grease rather than going purely by an, an, an eight-year schedule. Um, and of course, this saves a lot of money. Um, another aspect of this project is a phenomenon known as false Fresnelling. Uh, when we transport trains, if they're manufactured overseas, uh, the bearings, even though they're not running, are subjected to vibrations and that can cause uh, wear marks, which in turn, uh, when you run the bearings quickly, cause fatigue and degrade the bearings as they go. So that's another area we've been uh, working on. Um, so it, as part of that research, we, we uh, are very conscious we need to validate with some field measurements from bearings from the field, but also some experimental measurements of the wear process. Uh, so one of the important tools we use uh, is over here. It's known as a tribo lab. 
Uh, you can do all sorts of tribological measurements uh, to work out things like the, the friction coefficient and uh, how fast a particular material wears. Uh, so again, I'll pass over to Sheng to uh, show you a, a test we're doing at the moment. So what you're looking at is a test rig, uh, sorry, it's a tribal lab. It's, uh, it can do two type of tests. It's, um, at the moment, you're looking at what we call block on ring test. This is a um, very good replication of a bearing contact because you, uh, we have one block um, at the top, which is stationary. I'll just turn it on uh, so you can see more clearly. So, so the, the, the upper block um, is representing a, a rise way of the bearing and the lower, uh, the lower disc um, is uh, re representing the uh, roller. So, sorry. Um, okay. And um, so it's recreating that rolling, uh, that contact between the line contact between the raceway and the roller. We have this uh, oil bus, so we can put some lubricants in there. That way, we can investigate the uh, the effect of the lubrication in between that contact. So you can see now the the disc is spinning, and it's been uh, in a sliding contact uh, with that block we put on. Um, so the block we can machine the block into a particular shape uh, in order to recreate the same uh, contact pressure. Um, comparing to a real uh, bearing contact. So in that way, we can kind of recreate uh, what's happening inside the bearing in the lab. Um, also, during this process, we can uh, measure the normal and lateral forces. We can also control the temperature. Um, we actually have a temperature chamber, but I haven't put it on, but we can control the temperature uh, to as accurate as possible to recreate uh, what's inside the bearing. Thanks, Sheng. Um, another very important part of uh, understanding what's happening with these bearings is, again, measurement of the wear profile. Um, now, uh, the, the 3D profile we showed you just before is accurate to about uh, 40 micron. That's the, the 3D scanner. Uh, this tally surf is much more accurate and works on um, a contact uh, basis. So again, we have our little uh, element there that we showed you in the tribo lab representing a part of the bearing. And uh, the tally surf takes very accurate measurements, uh, accurate to about one micron uh, to measure that wear profile. Okay. Um, another important part of the in investigations we do is getting a better understanding in uh, a, a 3D world of, of the process. Um, and I'll pass over to Jenny to talk about our microscope work. Hi. Um, so this is our 3D um, digital microscopy. So unlike the, uh, uh, conventional uh, microscopy, it has a, a different observation mode uh, where you can examine um, the surface defect in uh, different uh, methods. For, ex for example, it has a polarized light, light. So if your sample has a different polarization property, it's good to use. But today we're gonna just to demonstrate um, the very conventional way. So it's called a bright fill. Um, so one thing is it has a uh, function to do something like the confocal uh, scanning electron microscopy, which is um, it can build up a 3D image of the sample. So here we look at um, the block after the tribal test, just here, and then there's a wear mark in the, on the top of the block. So once you set the range of the sample, so this is the wear mark we want to look at. Uh, you just click the 3D. Uh, Acquisitions, 
So it will take um, the image in the different focal planes and stuck them together in order to get the 3D image. So go to the measurements. So this is uh, the typical 3D image after, um, the, after we've taken that. So here, um, depends on the resolution of the lens, uh, you can either take a high resolution image where we're looking at, um, for example, there's a very, um, very deep uh, wear marks up here on the top of the block. So, um, we can examine that and then do a calculation on the wear profile. Uh, the other thing is this uh, microscopic frame can be rotate, which allows you to observe um, the sample surface on the different angle. So, thank you. Thanks very much, Jenny. All right. Um, so we were going to just show you a couple of more things. Uh, the the Trivo Lab allows us to recreate the very local physics of what's going on in, in the, the bearing or, or wear process. Um, often we want to test uh, on, a, on a more larger level. Um, so uh, I'll just show you quickly um, an experiment here because this is, as far as we know, the only false Fresnelling uh, tester, uh, at least in, in Australia. Um, so we can place a number of bearings inside here and under very controlled conditions we can shape the bearings so we can mimic uh, a full transportation process of a train which can take of the order of um, three quarters of a year. So we can simulate that uh, in, a, in a much faster process uh, in the order of days. Um, the false Brunelling, uh, there's, there's uncertainty as to what, what type of vibration, which direction of the vibration, or is it a rotation that's causing it? Um, and we're able to investigate all those different options here. Uh, and we were able to uh, prove what was happening in our uh, field measurements in a, in a much faster case. And again, the false Brunelling marks we, we generate uh, in the lab can be looked at more closely using the other instrumentation I've shown you. Um, so finally, uh, another very important uh, test rig we have is our uh, rolling contact test rig here. Um, it's basically made up of two rollers of different uh, diameters. Uh, and we can investigate a whole range of wheel rail railway uh, phenomena. Uh, so we, it was an, originally built to um, investigate rail corrugations. So these are corrugations that develop on the rail surface, wavy, wavy patterns. Um, I think we have a measurement uh, here. Uh, Sheng, if you could jump to the... Uh, we can see a measurement here of the order of 150 microns. If you get down low to the rail looks, you can see that wavy pattern occurring. And at that amplitude, uh, the rail needs to be uh, reground very quickly uh, due to large vibrations and noise. So we've investigated again the modelling and control of that process. Um, and we've been able to recreate the corrugations which take over a year in the field uh, on this test rig in the order of uh, 10 hours. Um, another important railway phenomena we, we can investigate using this rig is known as wheel squeal. Um, it's a high pitched noise as a train goes around the corner. We might have a, a video here, uh, Sheng, maybe of the train. So here's a typical freight train going around the corner. Um, and you can hear some sort of scraping noise. And you might be able to hear a higher pitch, uh, more tune noise coming up. So that higher pitch noise, uh, there we go there you can see is a, is a pure note and it, it propagates very large distances and obviously is very annoying uh, for people living nearby. Um, 
it happens around a corner, so we can simulate a corner uh, using this test rig. Um, oh, we have another video here of the test rig actually simulating that noise. We put an angle of attack, so these shafts are slightly uh, non-aligned to simulate a corner. And although it's a different frequency, we can generate the same squeal phenomena uh, using this test rig. Okay, um, I think that's enough for now. Thanks, Michael. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Um, so I'll hand over to Kyle to just uh, give any questions that may have popped up during uh, this presentation. If there are questions more general to uh, the webinar, we will take them at the end. But if you have questions directly to Paul, uh, please uh, ask them now or Kyle can read the questions out on chat. Yeah, just a reminder to everyone to just use the Q&A function if you do have a question. We do have one there for you, Paul. Um, and it's, how does the results of a 3D scanner compare to a more industry standard CMM? Um, Shane, do you have any... I, I believe there... Um, so the, it depends on the accuracy. Uh, so the 3D scanner is accurate to 40 microns. Um, so as you can see, we have a tally surf machine, which is a contact device, uh, which gets much more accurate. It, it, it's accurate to about one micron. So it, it just depends on the, the machine, uh, I think. Thanks, Paul. No more questions coming through. Okay, thank you very much. So, so now we have to transition four floors up. And to, to make this a little bit less boring, we've prepared a little bit of an infotainment session while we move to the next lab. The Center for Advanced Material Processing and Manufacturing, AMPAM, is very lucky to call the Advanced Engineering Building its home. Many people don't know this, but the history of AMPAM and the Advanced Engineering Building are very closely linked as in fact it was the Queensland government at that time that requested that a centre focused on materials and processing would be established alongside the new building. One of the main aims of the Advanced Engineering Building was to bring together researchers focused on materials and manufacturing research from the three schools, the School of Chemical Engineering, the School of Mechanical and Mining Engineering and the School of Civil Engineering. The building features a very open architecture where it's easy to see what is going on in the different labs. And I really think that has helped to inspire collaboration across the different schools and research areas. The floor plan is laid out so that all the labs are on one side of the building whereas all the offices are on the opposite side. In addition to hosting a diverse range of research laboratories, the Advanced Engineering Building also features a number of state-of-the-art, high-quality teaching spaces. This includes a number of group learning and team-focused spaces, as well as probably the most stunning lecturing theater on campus. It is a bit of engineering trivia to know that the large wooden roof structure of the lecturing hall, made from engineered wood products, was built on the ground and then lifted into place in one single piece. All right, welcome everyone. So we now transition to the fire lab, and I'm here with Juan Hildalgo, Dr. Juan Hildalgo, yeah. uh, one of the fire engineering experts. And he will show us the uh, testing facilities here uh, in the Advanced Engineering Building. All right. Welcome, everyone, and good afternoon. My name is Juan Hidalgo, and I'm a senior lecturer uh, at the Fire Safety Engineering Research Group uh, here at the University of Queensland. 
Uh, today we are at the Fire Safety Laboratory, uh, one of the rooms that we have. Uh, this uh, laboratory is a laboratory we use for teaching and research purposes. And normally what we try to do in this lab is to characterize and investigate the performance of materials when they are exposed to fire conditions. Hi, okay, thank you. So, so one of the key features that, that we need to understand is that why fire safety is an important aspect uh, when we are investigating or developing materials. So fire safety affects uh, the users that normally use these materials. So we need to be really sure that when we develop a new product, it's safe to be used in the market. Uh, fire is a quite, quite a complex problem because it requires a, a, an, analyzing and investigating a multi-physics uh, that govern the problem. So if we look at a material such as this microphone I have here, so it's made of multiple materials that, that are, consist of normally of a change of carbons uh, and hydrogen chains, okay? So carbon and hydrogen atoms that are like linked together to form the structure that we see here. Now, something that we need to understand is that when we expose the material to heat, or when we expose the material to uh, conditions, uh, heating conditions from real fires, what we will see is that the materials will start to decompose. Those carbon and hydrogen chains will break down into smaller pieces, and those pieces will vaporize, they will gasify. That's what we normally call as a process of the, that we define as pyrolysis, is the generation of flammable gases from the heating process. Uh, from real fires. Now, once we develop the, those gases, those gases are gonna mix with the air surrounding that contains oxygen. The mixture that we create can become flammable once we reach a certain limit of flammability, once enough flammable gases are released and mixed with the oxygen. Once we produce a little bit of energy, then a combustion reaction will take place, and then that combustion reaction uh, releases energy and, and that energy, it will be lost to the environment, but also it will be sent back to the material itself. So what we will observe is that the reaction, the fire process or the combustion process will sustain itself because of this uh, loop where more energy will be released and sent back to the material, enhancing the pyrolysis process. So when we are designing products or when we are designing new materials, we need to take into account that the design process is a multi-criteria process. This implies that we need to take into account uh, problems such as manufacturing, uh, durability, sustainability, is, uh, and strength of the composite, but also we need to take into account the fire safety or the safety aspects when we develop this product. So something that we can do, it is to quantify the performance of these products when they are exposed to fire conditions and develop an optimization process. Now, how do we do that? Well, to do that, that's a quite a complex problem because fire, fire in itself uh, consists of many multi, multiple disciplines. So we need to understand combustion chemistry, we need to understand fluid dynamics, we need to understand thermal decomposition uh, reactions from, from the solids, we need to understand heat transfer, mass transfer, and also fluid dynamics and solid mechanics. So what we try to do in FIRE is to decouple the problem or to analyze the problem at different scales. So today what we are here is in one of the analytical rooms that we have in the FIRE lab. In the FIRE lab, we have a series of analytical tools that essentially allow us to investigate different aspects of materials. So what we do here is to take little amounts of materials that we will test. For example, uh, using this apparatus that we call the thermal gravimetric analysis. This is TGA. So this apparatus essentially helps us to investigate the thermal decomposition reactions. It helps us to investigate how the chemistry controls the problem. So essentially what we do is we take a really little tiny pieces of the material and we place them in crucibles like this here that you can see. So as you can see, this is my finger. Uh, the, the amount of materials that we place in here is quite, quite small. Why do we do that? Because what we try to understand is essentially if we, if we can decouple the problem of thermal decomposition from the heat transfer. So by testing really small samples, we ignore the heat transfer taking place uh, during the thermal decomposition. Uh, 
Now we take that sample and we insert it in a furnace. So this thing here is a furnace that can go up to 1500 Celsius. Now, what do we do in this furnace? So we can control the temperature that the, the sample is exposed to, and we can measure the mass. So we can see how the thermal decomposition takes place. Now we can also control um, the oxygen environment within, within the furnace so that we can induce also uh, oxidation reactions, which actually are quite important in the process of, of a fire development. Now, this process allows us to understand the chemistry, but the key thing is can we uh, upscale this process? Can we essentially uh, take that information and predict a fire? Well, the answer is no, because of this multi-scale problem and the other physics that will control the problem, okay? So what we are gonna try to do is that what, what is governing the fire behavior? So we need to take into account heat transfer. Now we were testing here really small samples and what we are gonna try to do now is, okay, what happens when you test real samples of real sizes, okay? That have representative thicknesses. So what we are gonna try to do is emulate conditions where the material that we are developing exchanges heat with the external conditions. For example, the fire, the smoke, okay? And then what we are gonna try to understand is how the process of heat transfer through the sample takes place. Those processes will govern the actual fire behavior. They will govern the amount of energy that is released. So what we are gonna try to do now is do this upscaling process uh, in the lab. So we are gonna move to other room where we can test uh, one of the samples that we are really interested in. So follow me, please. Okay, so welcome to the flammability room. Um, come on over here. So the flammability room, we are gonna take a turn here. Flammability room is essentially a room where we have equipment to test materials with realistic thicknesses, but with a relatively small sample size. So for example, we are gonna be looking at samples of these dimensions. So this is a sample extracted, for example, from a composite panel that we generally use in facades, okay? Now, what we are gonna do in this test is essentially expose the material to heating conditions that are realistic from fires. So how do we do that? So in here, what you can see is an apparatus that we call the cone calorimeter. It's called the cone calorimeter because A has a heater that looks like a cone, okay? That heater can go to heat fluxes up to 100 kilovolts square meter, which is essentially more or less 100 times the radiation that we can receive from the sun uh, on air, okay? Now this system, what it does is to produce a lot of heat at the surface that we will place where you can see this aluminum fold protection. Now what we are gonna try to do is essentially put the sample exposed to the heat and analyze A, how it's gonna lose mass with that scale. So that's a scale that will measure the mass so we can measure the burning rate. And then what we are gonna do is capture the gases through this exhaust system. And that's why we call it calorimeter. Why we use a calorimeter like this? So a calorimeter is essentially an exhaust system that will capture the smoke gases. But we will analyze here on the top, we will analyze oxygen, carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide. Understanding those species that are related to the combustion process, we will be able to measure the energy released during the fire, which we, we call heat release rate, okay? So we are gonna try to set this material on fire. So I'm gonna drop the mic for a moment, uh, bear with us. Okay, so, so what we have now, if, if we look closely, we have a material that it's placed, so that's a, a, remember it's an, a composite panel from a facade, 
And that material is in this sample holder that allows it, uh, in case that if it melts, it allows it uh, to make sure that we don't have uh, dripping here. Now, what we are doing at the moment is exposing the heat, uh, the, the surface to a heat. And we see that the material starts to heat up at the surface. Those gases that we can see here, those are pyrolysis gases, flammable gases that when are mixed at the right conditions, we will create a flame. So when that occurs, we will have an ignition. So what it's occurring at the moment is that the flammable gases that are generated because of the heat provided from the heater are in the sufficient amounts that when mixing with oxygen, that create a flammable mixture. Now, when that occurs, we see this visible flame. And this flame is essentially the amount of energy released. This is the combustion that is taking place, place in the gas phase. Now, during this burning process, the material is going to start losing mass. So what we are going to see is that with this scale, the amount of mass it starts to reduce. At the same time, you can see that the fire intensity starts to increase. How we see that? So we can see that the flame is getting bigger and bigger. That's because we are reaching a steady state of burning behavior that is controlled by essentially the energy balance between the heater and the sample itself. Now, those gases that you can see here are collected in the, in the hood and they are taken away. But we are measuring there, we are measuring oxygen, carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide. Now, why is this so important? Well, when we want to design a product, we need to understand the physics that control the different problems. So in the case of fire safety, we need to de define what quantities we can use to identify or quantify performance. So as you can see here in this test, we are quantifying two important parameters is how long it takes to ignite and what is the intensity from that fire. So when we are looking at design from infrastructure, what we are going to try to do is to look for optimal products. We could use this information to create new models, but that's actually a quite a complex process because you will need a lot of uh, inverse modeling approaches and assumptions to be able to create a model that defines the behavior of the product. Instead, what we can do is we can manufacture different strategies and we can identify whether that uh, behavior, uh, what, what materials will have a, bet, a better performance. Now you can see something that occurred uh, that is really common in this type of, for example, this is a really, really dangerous composite. It is mainly polyethylene. And what you can see that it starts dripping and melting, okay? So finally, you can see here that how the burning process is taking place. So essentially on this curve, we see how the, the heat release rate increased to a peak and at some point it starts to burn out once the fuel gets consumed, which we can see visually back here with less intensity of the flames. So that's the story I wanted to tell you and hopefully uh, you enjoy the rest of the seminar with us. Uh, welcome to the Power Lab. And if you want to know more about us, uh, please visit our website or visit the AMPAM website uh, that we close uh, we collaborate closely with them, right? Thank you so much. All right, thank you very much, Juan. Um, maybe quick to Kyle, do we have any questions for Juan? No, no questions have come through, Michael. Um, anyone out there, if, if you do have a question, please pop it in the Q&A. Okay, no, no questions. I thank think you. all the questions are answered. Otherwise, we can always come back, Juan is, I uh, definitely always have to go answer yeah. questions. Yeah, really welcome always uh, to have you guys in the lab. So if you're interested about learning more about fire safety, uh, please feel free to contact us or visit us here on YouTube. All right. Um, so now we switch to another lab. And again, a little bit of infotainment while we make the tour to the next lab. Within the Advanced Engineering Building, there are a number of world-class research facilities that are regularly used by AMPAM researchers. What you see here is only a small snapshot of what's available. On level two of the building, you can find a large scale testing area 
which hoists a strong wall and a strong floor for the testing of large civil structures, the very unique triaxial and biaxial plus impact testing facilities, the incremental sheet forming machine, as well as a digital fabrication cell consisting out of industrial robot and a water jet cutter. On the upper floors of the building, you can find laboratories dedicated to material characterization and manufacturing process development. This includes the mechanical testing laboratory, facilities dedicated to tribology, and a large number of laboratories dedicated to corrosion research, polymer processing and characterization, composite manufacturing and testing, as well as state-of-the-art additive manufacturing facilities, including a selective laser melting 3D metal printer. On the top floor of the building, you can find a large arc plasma furnace, one of Australia's hottest furnaces, as well as a foundry and a fire testing laboratory. Here is another bit of trivia. You might wonder why those facilities are on the top floor. The reason for this is that in the case of a fire, we only lose the top floor of the building. All right, so now the last stop is the composite. Talk about, and, and it's obviously always hard after uh, coming after the fire group, but we can do one better. So we really want to look at materials which offer some of the highest thermal performance of any material available. And these materials that we're talking about here are ceramic matrix composites. Now, some of you might be familiar with polymer matrix composites, which are made from a plastic and a fiber. These materials are used in applications such as automotive, or some of you might also have them in, in some of your sports equipment. Now, the world of ceramic matrix composites is nearly like a parallel universe where many things that we know from polymer matrix composites can be applied, but some properties are completely different. And one or two of those properties which are worthwhile emphasizing is that, for example, with polymer matrix composites, typically the matrix is very ductile and protects the fiber. In the case of ceramic matrix composites, we have exactly the opposite. So we have very brittle and very hard matrices. Another important difference between the two materials and the reason why we use those materials for very demanding applications in high temperature environments is the resistance to temperature. So moist polymers tend to melt somewhere between around 180 and 400 degrees. Now, with this type of ceramic matrix composites, we can reach temperatures in excess of two and a half thousand degrees. So they really are at the pinnacle of what's available from a material space or from a material point of view. Now, just to give you a quick summary of how we make these materials and how we test them. So the manufacturing process that we are focusing on is called polymer infiltration and py pyrolysis, called PIP. So we start off with pretty much the same way as we would make a polymer matrix composite. So we have our fabric, in this case, a carbon fiber fabric, and we have a polymer resin. Now, the difference is that this is a very special polymer resin, which contains all the building blocks that we require to produce the ceramic. In the first manufacturing step, we then produce our shape. And this is really one of the main advantages that we can basically use similar manufacturing processes 
that we know from traditional polymer matrix composites. So for example, we can do open mold forming. And as you can see, you can make very complex shapes or we can also do a process called filament winding. And that's particularly useful because many applications of, such as rocketry or hypersonics have rotation symmetric shapes. So with filament winding, we basically wind a toy of our fiber onto the mandrel, which then gives it its form. And that's really the advantage of the PIP process that we can use uh, existing polymer matrix composite manufacturing processes to obtain the shape. After that, it's very different. So what we end up with once we have cured our resin is what we call a green body. So the green body is basically a polymer matrix composite made with the resin that has all the building blocks for our ceramic. And you can really hear it. So I'm tapping to, to get the two green bodies and you can hear really a plasticky sound. So now the next step is to convert the polymer into the ceramic. And this is done through a process called pyrolysis. So very similar to what we've seen in the fire lab, but this time with the strict exclusion, exclusion of oxygen, we can convert the polymer into a ceramic. And once we converted the polymer into the ceramic, we basically have our ceramic matrix composite. And now you can hear it really sounds more like a ceramic than a, a polymer. Now, one of the challenges with the polymer matrix composite is that you, that we need, so one of the major challenges with PIP process is that we have to do multiple infiltrations. So we have to cure the polymer uh, we have to uh, pyrolyze the polymer multiple times to increase the density of our ceramic material. Now, the last thing we wanted to show is how we actually test these sort of materials. And just before we do that, we can also show you some of the parts we've made here, which show some of the added difficulties because not only are these materials very, very temperature resistant, but they are also extremely hard. So for example, this material is silicon carbide, which is one of the hardest material. And therefore it can be very difficult to machine some of the features that you can see here. Now to finish off, I hand over to Byron and he will show us how we do testing using our oxyacetylene test plane. Thank you, Michael. Well, actually, um, this is our OxyTorch test rig, and um, I will do a demonstration of how to test a carbon-carbon composite. As you can see here, we have the sample mounted in this special fixture, and basically what we're gonna do is that uh, we ran a very standard flame, uh, we call it a neutral flame, for a flame, um, and we have you know, a very specific ratio of acetylene and oxygen. So I think with that, um, I'm going to start the test. So basically, uh, first we just, um, we just, thank you, Mike. Uh, we just uh, turn on the flame. And now we just regulate, you know, the, the the flow rates. So it's the ratio is about eight liters per minute for acetylene and about eleven liters per minute for oxygen to get a neutral frame. That's about right. That's good, so that's perfect. We have the flame and we basically 
put the sample in and they you can see how persistent this material can be. What about the video? Okay, so I think that's enough. We're gonna take it out. And we can see. Okay, and as you can see, like now, obviously the part is extremely hot. And just to give you a reference, so the surface temperatures of that material would have been somewhere between 1,600 and about 2,000 degrees during the, this test. And as you can see, the part is completely intact. Now, we have performed the same test yesterday. And you can see, so this is a, a mild steel plate. And this is how a mild steel plate looks after about 45 seconds. So, so you can, after 20 seconds, sorry, I'm, I stand corrected. <laughs> so, so, so now you, you can see really the difference of, of these materials. Okay, so, so now I think this brings us to the end of this webinar on high temperature materials. I really hope you enjoyed the webinar and I hope this format uh, gave you a slightly different perspective of some of the research that's going on within the Center for Advanced Material Processing and Manufacturing. Now if you have any questions we'll take some questions shortly and in the meantime we have also prepared a poll where we just try to gauge your interest in future seminars and your feedback on this format. Just before I finish, I really wanted to thank everyone that made this seminar possible. So Paul Meehan and Juan uh, for presenting, but then also a large team, particularly from, from the composite group. Uh, so Christian, uh, Akshay and Byron and Harry, which in the background have helped with a lot of the tech that was necessary to make this work. Now, if you have any questions, I put my earphones in so I can hear the questions that Kyle can put through. Thanks very much, Michael. And a big thanks also to, to Paul and Juan for, for your presentations today. I think everyone, some good comments coming through there. Everyone found it very informative and, and interesting. Um, so if anyone does have any questions, just pop them now in the Q&A and, um, and Michael will be able to answer them. And maybe whilst we wait for questions to come in, um, some people here in the building call me the tour guide and I would really like to extend this offer. I, I think we try to be as live as possible, but I think there's nothing beating the real thing. So if, if you are close to the campus and you have an interest in materials and manufacturing research, uh, please reach out. Um, we're always interested to show you our facilities and obviously learn about how we can potentially collaborate and help you solve some of your material and manufacturing challenges. So I think we have a question. Yeah, so one question's come through, Michael, and it's how complex of geometries can be made with your existing CMC capabilities? Yeah, so, so maybe the best way to show this is, is probably this part. So, so this is around the complexity that we can currently master with the PIP process. Um, so, so this part has been through nine PIP cycles, so it's close to fully densified. And, and, and you can see some of the features that we can produce. 
Um, but when it comes, so one of the challenges is the machining and, or, and, and finishing of ceramic matrix composite parts made from silicon carbide just due to the high hardness of the material. So the process that we are using is multiple steps of machining during the green body stages and after the pyrolysis. So every time we re-infiltrate, we re-machine the geometric features that are of, of, of importance. Thanks, Michael. We just had a, another question come through. For the incremental forming, can the metal form undercut metal parts? Oh, so, so, so now obviously I'm left without Paul <laughs> um, being here. So, so I think maybe that's a, a question I, I have to take offline before I, I make something up on the fly that I really don't understand much about. Um, sure. Maybe uh, if you can capture the name of the person, we'll, we'll try to answer the question. Yeah, sure. Offline. Lee, Lee, um, Lee the, there will be a, an, an email going out after the webinar with uh, contact details. So, um, so we'll, we'll get back to you on that one. And any final questions? I think we'll take one more. We're already over time. So one more question uh, and then we might wrap it up. Okay, I don't think there's any more questions, Michael. All right, I, I think then we can finish this webinar. So I would like to thank everyone for making this webinar possible, but also for everyone for attending the webinar. And uh, I, I think it, it brings us to the, at least for AMPAM, uh, to the end of, of sort of a quite interesting year. And, and hopefully you enjoyed the webinar and we're looking forward to, if we get some positive feedback around the webinar, to uh, run another webinar uh, next, uh, in, in the new year, sometimes in February. All righty. Thanks, Michael. And thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. Um, just to let you know, this is the fourth session of our Leaders of Influence webinar series. Uh, there will be one more coming up at the end of the month, so keep an eye out for the uh, the email invitation as it comes through. Um, and obviously also keep up to date um, through our Engineering Architecture and IT Facebook page, web page and LinkedIn group where we'll post um, dates for the, of events and, and news and things that are coming up. Um, thanks again and stay safe and we look forward to hosting you all again soon. Thanks.